It's my nerd world, a Star Wars show. On this week's episode, I was expecting it to be a shorter episode. I wanted to talk a bit about the Skeleton Crew trailer that dropped uh, last week, and we have some emails to share. However, right before I started my recording, some major news relating to the Star Wars franchise on the big screen from Deadline dropped, and I'm excited to be able to share this with you. As again, the news just came out. As always, the My Nerd World of Star Wars show is brought to you by the Embark Science Fiction Space Opera series. Head on over to Amazon.com and search for John J.O. and Justice. There you will find all seven books in every format. After Earth faces its end, follow pilots Taft Katha and their ragtag crew on a journey of survival across the galaxy as they fight for humanity's future. Again, head on over to Amazon.com and check out Embark. Now, let's get to this week's episode. Nothing will stand in our way. I find your lack of faith disturbing. I will finish what you started. Who are you? I'm no one. There are stories about what happened. It's true. All of it. The Force. It's calling to you. My nerd road. Just let it in. It is my nerd world, and welcome to it. I'm your host, John Justice, here on a Star Wars show. And listen, I'm excited to share with you this breaking news from Deadline. I was certainly not expecting this, and I hope it means what I think it means. Not just in the details of the story, but in the larger picture of what Lucasfilm and Disney need to do to get the Star Wars franchise back on track and into the movie theaters beyond the Mandalorian and Grogu film coming out in 2026. This is not going to go the way you think. Lucasfilm has closed a deal with Simon Kinberg to develop a trio of Star Wars films. Kinberg will write the trio and produce them with Lucasfilm chief Kathleen Kennedy. I heard this will comprise episodes 10 through 12 of the Skywalker saga that began with Lucas and his 1997 first film that, along with Steven Spielberg's Jaws, of course, reshaped the global blockbuster game. Now, before I continue, there is some reporting in the wake of this breaking news story. Jordan Mason, who's been pretty good in terms of the rumor mill and reports coming out of Hollywood, who says that this is not going to be episodes 10, 11, and 12. So we'll just kind of put a bit of a a bit of a caveat on this particular article that some individuals who are tapped into Hollywood are already saying that this won't specifically be episodes 10 through 12. Now, even in the story itself, it gets a little bit confusing relating to how they're describing this trilogy of films that Simon Kinberg is allegedly to be writing. Insiders disputed, as I mentioned, my intel that Kinberg will continue that storyline, meaning the Skywalker storyline, saying this will instead begin a new saga and sit alongside Star Wars and the percolating projects with James Mangold. This would be the Dawn of the Jedi film. Charmin Obeyed Shinoi. This would be the post-Episode 9 Daisy Ridley-led film. And Taika Waititi, which I thought was shelved and shoved off to the side. And Donald Glover, which would be the film relating to Lando Calrissian. As usual, Lucasfilm and Disney are not commenting. Kinberg previously worked with Lucasfilm in co-creating Dave Filoni and Carrie Beck in the Emmy-nominated animated series Rebels that ran for four seasons from 2014 to 18. He was also a consultant on Star Wars Episode Seven: The Force Awakens, the J.J. Abrams-directed film that revived the, the franchise back in 2015. 
He has also been heavily involved in other franchises as a writer or producer. This includes a decade spent on the X-Men films and the Logan spinoff that starred Hugh Jackman and was directed by Mangold. Um, one thing that has me concerned is that he directed one of these films, and it doesn't look like he's directing this particular film, so therefore I'm less worried about it. But he directed what is the worst X-Men movie, Dark Phoenix. I watched it once. I'll never watch it again. However, his inclusion... With Well, his working with Dave Filoni on Rebels and the fact that Kinberg wrote some of the best Rebels episodes does get me excited. And it makes sense relating to Dave Filoni and his current status being in charge of various Lucasfilm Star Wars projects. So on that front, relating to Star Wars, I think that Simon Kinberg is a, a good writer and knows how to write Star Wars. He was also a producer on the first two Deadpool films, executive producer of the 2024 blockbuster Deadpool and Wolverine. He produced Ridley Scott, uh, directed The Martian, which I loved, has scripted other films such as Mr. and Mrs. Smith, of which I'm a huge fan, co-wrote the film that launched the Sherlock Holmes franchise with Robert Downey Jr. and Jude Law, who, of course, is in The Skeleton Crew, and I'll talk about that trailer here in just a moment. He also produced the Kenneth Branagh Agatha Christie film trilogy, that I quite enjoy, that started with The Murder on the Orient Express. In short, he's comfortable with the franchise sphere. He's going to be producing Paramount's remake, uh, upcoming remake, uh, remake of Stephen King's The Running Man, which also just went into production. He's also produced Paramount's Star, War, uh, Star Wars uh, films as well. So one thing that I find interesting is how closely aligned Simon Kinberg is to the Deadpool and Wolverine, and there's been a ton of talk relating to Sean Levy, who directed Deadpool and Wolverine, who has said to also have been working on a Star Wars film on his own. So I think there is a possibility if you begin to sort of bring out the push pins and the yarn and the cork board, you could see a direct through line to perhaps Simon Kinberg writing a trilogy of films that maybe one or all could be directed by Sean Levy. Now, this has me excited except for the fact that how many different Star Wars projects have come and gone over the years? A lot. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, some of the ones that are mentioned here, I'm wondering if they will ever see the light of day. The James Mangold Dawn of the Jedi film after the failure that was um, Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, of which James Mangold uh, directed. All the controversies around the Charmin Obeyed Shinoy alleged directed Daisy Ridley post Episode Nine Star Wars film. That writer just getting the boot. So first off, you have to go. All right, he has signed on. He's closed a deal to write these movies. So this would allegedly mean that they're moving forward with it. Of course, no way to tell timeline at this point in time. What I'm hoping for, though, is that this would be the dawn of a new era. That perhaps Lucasfilm is getting their ducks in a row, understand how important it is to get a franchise like Star Wars back on track beyond a spinoff film, which is essentially, essentially what the Mandalorian and Grogu movie is. It's a spinoff film. I have always been of the opinion that it is foolish for Lucasfilm to ditch the episodic nature of those first nine movies, or I should just say those nine movies, in favor of going off in some other direction. I do think it's a good idea to create a trilogy, and I think it's a fantastic idea if you're going to tap one writer to sign all three movies so there is a level of consistency and we don't end up with the controversies like we had with The Force Awakens, The Last Jedi, and The Rise of Skywalker. As always, three films that I love but I can recognize how disjointed they are, especially Ryan Johnson's The Last Jedi sitting in the middle, which I absolutely love. I feel like it's kind of the stake of Star Wars, whereas the J.J. Abrams Force Awakens and, and uh, The Rise of Skywalker are more really, really great pizza, right? There's a difference. You're in the mood for different things. Sometimes really, really great pizza is the thing to go to. When given a chance, I'm probably going to default to really, really great pizza. But I also love myself a really good, grilled, thick ribeye steak, which is what The Last Jedi is. However, going and eating pizza and steak doesn't really always go together. 
So having one writer to direct these to write these three films, I think, is a fantastic idea. And I also think that maybe you should perhaps get a director to do all three. That way there is some consistency. At a bare minimum, I just hope this is solid enough to where they can get things back on track. I think that Star Wars, and I've said this many times, is best served on the big screen. And I think it's best served when you're telling a saga story. Now, if they want to start a brand new saga... I'm cool with that. Thumbs up. I still think it's foolish that you don't go with episodes 10, 11, 12. This is what has the most cultural... This is what the culture has the most attachment to, are those episodic films. Regardless of the controversy surrounding them, The Rise of Skywalker made a lot of money. And if they were to produce an episodes 10, 11, and 12, there's nothing to say that those movies could not be absolutely fantastic. And revive the franchise. That is to say, it's not automatically going to be a failure just because there is so much controversy swirling around episodes 7, 8, and 9. It's exciting news either way. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Feel free to drop me an email, talkshownerd at gmail.com, talkshownerd at gmail.com. Or if you'd like and you're watching this on YouTube, leave me a comment on YouTube and I'll share your thoughts on next week's uh, episode. It has been an incredibly busy week for me, with this being the election. I finally got a full night's sleep uh, last night, but for about like 48 hours, I was only sitting with about eh, three and a half hours sleep at best. So I'm going to keep this week's episode relatively short compared to other episodes. But I did want to spend a moment talking about the Skeleton Crew full trailer that dropped last week. This is a series that, because it is Star Wars, I am very much looking forward to. I'm also in the middle of a rewatch of Stranger Things, and so the Skeleton Crew series, which drops here just in a few weeks on December 3rd, is hitting, for me personally, just the right spot because I'm in the middle of watching Stranger Things, and while we're looking at two different genres relating to Star Wars and Stranger Things, we are talking about two series that are going to be focusing on young people and have a lot of inspiration taken from 80s emblem young coming-of-age adventure stories. I really enjoyed this trailer. As a matter of fact, my excitement and anticipation for Skeleton Crew went up quite a bit. I felt that they really struck the right tone with this trailer, gave us just enough of the story and the imagery to pique the interests of those of us who've been frustrated quite a bit with the Star Wars live-action series that have been so hit or miss. I initially was, I don't want to say turned off, but the inclusion of Major Tom, the 80s song, in the trailer itself had me scratching my head a bit, and then even more so with the fact that the lyrics were being sung sung in Hatties. That being said, after numerous rewatches of Skeleton Crew, I've kind of brushed that aside, and, and it fits the tone and the vibe of the show. It's an interesting choice. I very much like the Hatties song that Sabine was listening to while she was riding the speeder in episode one of the Ahsoka series. And as a matter of fact, I actually went and downloaded that track, and it's on my playlist for when I go out on my daily rides. I understand what the attempt here was. It was an attempt to take this 80s song that is familiar with certain generations, and certainly those that grew up with the Star Wars franchise, To bring about a certain vibe for that audience, but also making sure that they threaded it right into Star Wars by having the lyrics being sung in Hatties. I think it would have worked on the other level as well, but I understand why they made that decision. It is a little bit odd, and you don't want to think too much about it, because why does a, you know, an Earth... Um, you know, an earthbound 80s song being sung in Hatties on a Star Wars trailer. Okay, I just, but again, I understand the tone that they were going for, and its inclusion sets the stage to tell you and tell the older audience that, hey, this is a Star Wars adventure, which is even on some of the promotional material. They're calling it a Star Wars adventure, so they're already saying directly to you, hey, this is the type of story that we're going to be telling with these young people. Um, that being said, listen, the imagery in it was great. 
the we know that there's are going to be pirates in it the setting the stage of how the kids got on the ship and ended up um hitting hyperspace away from where they are their parents are clearly looking for them i hope the show hits the mark this trailer certainly hit the mark for me and got me excited for it i will say going back to the song just briefly i i don't know what lucas films aversion is to using traditional star wars music I, I just don't get that. Everybody knows traditional Star Wars music. And while I can see the argument for including this 80s song to, you know, give you a certain piece of messaging relating to what to expect, you know, I, I hope that we get some more Star Wars themes inside of this particular show. I feel like Ahsoka did one of the better jobs in bringing us new music but still tapping into the vibe of what John Williams created, much in the same way that Rebels did. But they seem to be really, really afraid of getting into that specific Star Wars music that we know. The music that just immediately, you know, hits you in that right moment. I mean, I play it in my trailer, you know. I mean, we just immediately get the vibe and it takes you exactly where you want to go. My guess is the reason why they do this is because they want to leave that music special so that it always has that particular impact. But I question whether or not there would ever be burn on that music if they included the motifs more often that we've grown up with and grown so accustomed to. You know, if I ever had a chance to sit down with any of the executives that are in charge of these types of decision making, that is something that I would definitely uh, want to be asking them. I need someone. To show me my place in all this. Talkshownerd at gmail.com. Uh, and again, if you're enjoying uh, my Nerd World, a Star Wars show on YouTube, leave me a comment there. Benjamin Moffat writes in this week. I love the show. Thank you. And please continue the great content. Thank you, Benjamin. I've really been getting back to listening weekly, but it brought me, but it's brought me back to a lot of frustration as we continue to await any big screen release. And quite frankly, I blame Disney plus streaming for the majority of my feelings. Getting Star Wars fans onto the into the theater is the best way of getting money out of the Star Wars content. Obi-Wan, Ahsoka, Boba Fett, all would have done well on the big screen for what they were and produced additional dollars for Disney, while additionally drawing us back to where we all belong. It feels like Disney was hoping to spark and find the next big deal out of all these Disney Plus drops, and now we're stuck. Looking forward to Mando on the big screen. Keep up the great work. Thank you, Benjamin Moffat. Thank you, Benjamin. I appreciate the email this week. Look, a lot of this came out of the post-pandemic era, and there was this idea that this is where everybody was going to go. And there was a ton of talk even before that happened, that the movie theater experience was dying and that movie theaters were dying out and that the pandemic was going to be the death knell for the, you know, the blockbuster. And everybody was going towards streaming, and they sunk all their money into streaming, and I think it was a mistake. I think we're in a world now where it's a bit of a combination of the two. But we do know that if you make a good movie, the people will go out and see it, and there's still a ton of money to be made. What we're dealing with now is a continued course correction in our entertainment medium on a number of levels. And I'm excited for what the future's going to bring. I really am. When you consider the results of the election this week, and just how the country spoke in such a resounding voice about the direction they wish this country would um, be heading in versus the one that we have been heading in, the direction they want us to go into instead of the way we were going. I think this is also going to have a major impact on our entertainment as well, and I think it's going to be for the better. Listen, if you are a listener of the show and the outcome this week wasn't what you had hoped for, it's cool. We can all agree to to disagree. That being said, there was a, you know, a, a massive wave that swept across the country of individuals saying we want to go a different direction. And I think that doesn't just apply to when it comes as it relates to our politics, but I think that just relates to society as a whole.
And I feel like we're going to see a big course correction that's going to have a major impact profoundly in a positive way heading into the future. And it's my view that that's also going to be, um, you know, have an impact on what we're seeing. And the fact that Disney went and tapped um, Simon Kinberg and has closed a deal for him to write a trio of movies tells me that the focus for Disney is looking back at the big screen and less on the small screen. Thank you so much for checking out uh, this week's uh, episode brought to you by Embark, the science fiction adventure series. Book one of Embark, um, available available now on Amazon.com uh, to search for Embark and John J-O-N Justice. Goes as follows, Taft has found something and humanity won't survive without it. When ship mechanic Taft Guardia agrees to help starfighter pilot Kate Amaro investigate a cryptic message from her late aerospace engineer father, they embark on a perilous journey of discovery amid a looming planet-wide industrial catastrophe. In the middle of a global evacuation, two rival megacorporations are on the brink of interstellar war as Taft Katha and their ragtag crew discover what may be the only hope of saving Earth's evacuees from annihilation. I hope you'll take a moment and treat yourself a friend or a family member, especially this holiday season, with science fiction. It's written for adults, but appropriate for ages 11 plus. Pick up Embark Book One today. Available in ebook, Kindle Unlimited, hardcover, paperback, and audiobook. If you like your science fiction to be epic, filled with romance, really amazing technology, unique action sequences, then Embark is perfect for you. Amazon.com, search for Embark and John J O N Justice. I look forward to hearing from you between now and next week. And as always, I hope wherever you are, you're happy, you're healthy, and you're safe. God bless, and I'll talk to you then. Bye. The Force will be with you, always. My nerd world.